Tonight I'm going to be talking about the edible aspects of trees. And as a forager, I like knowing what's growing out there in the wild that is food for us, for our species. But tonight we're focusing on trees. And I'll be talking about ones mostly that are native to this part of the world, but also some that are naturalized that aren't native but have um, naturalized out into the wild. And a lot of these are trees that you could plant if you wanted to. And all of them that I'll cover tonight have at least one edible aspect to them. I always like to tell people before you eat anything that you don't know, anything from the wild, any new food, make sure you can identify it. Make sure, 101% sure, that you know what it is. You want to know, what do I do with that plant? Is there only a certain part of the plant or only a certain part of the tree that's, that's safe to eat? Um, you want to know, do I have to do something special to it? Do I have to cook it? Because some wild edibles that we forage are not safe unless they're cooked. Um, some things are not safe unless they're ripe. So you want to know as much as you can find out about that plant. I always tell people, if you're foraging, if you're into um, learning about what's out there in nature that you can eat, um, I tell people usually um, start with one plant at a time. Okay? Even if it's like something really, I usually tell people, start with something really common that you really know, like dandelions. Okay? Um, learn all you can about it. Don't believe everything that you read online. You can get in trouble that way. Don't believe everything that you read in the book. And don't believe everything that one person tells you. So ideally, you'd go out and, and learn the plant in its natural habitat and have somebody like, explain to you how to identify it. It's best if you can learn about it from more than one book, field guide, more than one website, multiple sources. So you don't get in trouble. Because some plants have lookalikes. Things never look exactly alike, but sometimes they're close enough where if you're not really careful, um, you might make mistakes. We don't want to make that kind of mistake. Mm. I bet somebody can identify this native tree. <laughs> yeah. That's our beautiful native red bud. And every one of those pretty flowers is edible. Isn't that cool? Um, the, that bright pink pigment in there is actually an antioxidant called anthocyanin. And it's very, it's a powerful antioxidant and protective against cancer and cardiovascular disease, those, those pigments in there. Um, a lot of pigments in fruits and vegetables and all sorts of plants, pigments or colors, a lot of them are actually the antioxidant compounds, like, for example, the lycopene in tomatoes. Okay. Um, that would be the red pigment. Here's the pink pigment that's very powerfully antioxidant. And by the way, red blood flowers have more vitamins than you can usually. And I have this interesting quality, this tree, um, called glory, where the flowers actually grow from the main from the trunk and the main branches. Um, it's interesting. It's a little heart shaped in these. Okay, so if you're ever going to eat the flowers off a red bud, make sure it's a red bud. Okay? You can look in different books, different websites, but just make sure. Um, what is they are. And, um, I made a really nice red bud flower lemon <coughs> loaf. Yeah. <laughs> and here's another edible flower that comes off a tree. Okay. This is black locust. This is, this is also a native tree, native to this part of the world. And we're getting into location. I like to include the real names of plants because sometimes common names can be very confusing. Here you know what the plant is. Um, and all those flowers are edible. Now, every other part of this tree is poisonous. So if you're going to eat it, don't eat the leaves and don't eat the little twigs, just the flowers, okay? You can eat them raw, you can cook them into little fritters, in salads, and they taste like they smell. So if you've ever walked underneath a black locust when it's in bloom, and that really heady fragrance, that's how they taste. Mm -hmm. They're great. And they're nutritious. What kinds of nutrients in that? Um, they thrive in poor soil. I don't know that you're going to want to plant one because they can be weedy. Um, but if I had a black locust on my property, um, I wouldn't take them. <laughs> um, they bloom in May. They have a very short window. Their bloom time is like 
two geeks. Um, <coughs> and we have to source for these. And of course we're going to make them. Yeah. So you don't need the steps, just the, yeah. Just the, um, the flower of the real nice. Red, uh, black lotus, shredded apple. Service berry can be either a shrub or a small tree. And service berry, I love the fruits of them. People sometimes compare them to blueberries because they kind of look like blueberries. I think they taste so much better. They're a little chewier. They have little seeds in them that taste like almond. They're really good. Service berries, also called green berries, shadow, cascatoon berries. They say it's a small tree. And um, that's what the berry looks like when it's ripe. It has a little crown on it, like a blueberry. And it gets little white flowers, five petaled flowers. And, um, almost right berry there. And just like all edible berries, very nutritious. A lot of um, antioxidants. Red and purple berries are also. Oh, yeah, that one is going into the next bit. <laughs> and that's up. Service berries and mulberries. Um, hawthorn. I have um, I have some kind of show and tell here. And if you pick up the hawthorn wait, you want to pick it up really, really carefully and look for the thorns. Thorns on hawthorn can be like up to four inches long. But even when they're not that long, long, they're really, really sharp. Okay, so if you pick this up or you just not have to pick it up, you look at it and you'll see those thorns. Believe me, they're sharp. I think um, the hawthorn is interesting because it, you can eat the little spring leaves, which is really that's a popular thing to do in Europe, to eat hawthorn, flower buds, flowers, and leaves. And for that reason, they call it the bread of the trees tree. And sometimes kids will make like sandwiches out of the leaf and the flower bud and the leaf. The bread of the cheese tree. Um, and it's native. A lot of different species of um, some forage plants, some wild edible plants, um, actually have scientific research to back up the claims that people make. Okay, and people have been using hawthorn berries and leaves for centuries, um, for mostly for as a heart tonic for different heart conditions. And this plant, they actually did some scientific research. And it's it's known, it's backed by science, the claims that it's, it strengthens the heart. So if you ever want to look into that, I think it's really interesting. There is actual research there, they put the money into it. You don't eat the, this little seeds. It's kind of like apple seeds, you don't eat them. So if you ever you know, taste one of these in the wild, spit out the seeds, okay? But flesh or juice um, broth, cooked into a jam or a jelly, and there's one of those thorns, just the flesh. So sometimes when people cook with mulberries, they have a lemon juice or something. But um, very nutritious. And you don't want to eat raw leaves. <coughs> but cooked leaves are popular in some countries, especially China. Uh, cooked mulberry leaves, they eat it as a vegetable. Okay. You don't want to eat the raw leaves or the unripe fruit, the green fruit. fruit. Um, and there, there are reports, and I'm not sure, how accurate it is, but a lot of people and a lot of sources say that, that green mulberries are hallucinogenic. Don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> but just don't ever eat green mulberries. Um, make sure they're soft and juicy. Um, what is it? Mulberry leaves. The leaves can kind of um, do 
different in shape. They're always lobed, but sometimes they're very lobed. And they always have those little um, serrated edges or little scalloped edges. Mulberry. And the most common type of mulberry is non-native. So it's, it's called the white mulberry, even though the fruit gets like red purple. It's called white mulberry. That's the most common one, and it's not native. The red mulberry is native, but it's very uncommon. It's, you know, you'll find it sometimes um, in more wooded areas, but um, the non-natives. I like to say non-native or invasive species, if you can't eat them, eat them. So eat your mulberries. Um, another fruit that's very rich in those anthocyanins, so very antioxidant. Um, that's good for you. And that's a mulberry. <laughs> Cobbler. <laughs> okay. Oops. Produce acorns. Acorns are the nut of an oak tree. And people are always surprised to know that you can eat an acorn. All you have to do is break open the acorn. And that's not meat inside is edible. But you do have to soak out the bitterness, the bitter tannins in there. Um, and regardless of what type of oak it is, there's always bitterness to be soaked out. Um, so you would take the nut meat and grind it or chop it and either soak it, soak it, soak it, or simmer it or boil it to get the tannins out. If you do it the hot water method, simmer, boil, it changes the flavor of acorns, which some people think is fine. I've ABed them and I don't like the taste at all when it's done simmered or boiled, um, but it's, they're very nutritious. Very nutritious. <coughs> they have a lot of protein and vitamins. It's, uh, they were an important sort of source of food for the American Indians, native people used to um, eat a lot of acorns. And what they would do to reach out the tens, I always think this is so cool, they would take the nut meats and grind them or chop them, put them in a basket, put the basket in a stream and let the stream rinse the tannins out. And then you just use them like any nut. If you ever find an acorn that has a tiny little hole in it, okay, you don't want to eat that one. It's a little hole in it. It's not like it's either. White oak, you can tell white oak by the rounded instead of the, um, instead of the pointed oak. They're rounded. They tend to be white oak. Acorns tend to be less bitter, less tannins than red oak, but they still need to be bleached. So there's red oak. Ski trails, that's like how you identify red oak. It comes like that. And there's a mixture of, we have red, we have chestnut oak here. They're nice. They're larger than white oak and even milder than like white oak. But all acorns are edible. Sumac. Whenever I say sumac, people, I can actually hear them. Mm. It's like poison. I've right? heard of poison sumac. There is a poison sumac. And they're not closely related, and you don't have to worry about this one. This is the edible sumac. Okay, so sumac. The part that you're interested in is that red, fuzzy berry cluster. You just snap it off, and soak it in cold water, and let the goodness leach out into the water, and you've got wild lemonade. You can sweeten it if you want. Um, this is what they look like. You might see these sometimes like along the road, you'll see them. Okay. Those are, yeah, they call them bobs. Clusters. And if you taste one, you just taste it and see if it's ready yet. And you'll taste that tart and lemony taste a little bit. It's really good. Um, and you can make a beverage out of it. A nutritious beverage. I think it tastes better than lemonade, actually. If I sweeten it lightly, I think it's really, really good. Edible sumac. So just to put your mind at ease, <laughs> poison sumac. The berries don't look anything like that. It's not those upright red fuzzy berry clusters. They're dangly and they're whitish or light green. Okay, so those are poison sumac types. Right, side by side. <laughs> Bad and the good. And again, if you're ever interested in eating any of these things, learn more about it. Different books, guidebooks, you know, trail uh, field guides, different websites, and hopefully if you can get somebody to actually show you the plant. Um, Maple, so I'm not going to say too much about maple because the maple experts are here, but maple, that's a sugar maple there. And maple has a bunch of different parts that are edible. 
I won't talk too much about the year, although I used to tap the trees. I used to work at the um, at the Great Swamp Education Center in, uh, in New Jersey, and we used to tap them every January and February, and they can make a syrup, and have to make a syrup festival. But it's actually, they produce sap that you can drink the sap as is, or you can boil it down to make a syrup. Um, and we used to actually, we didn't have sugar maples at the Great Swamp, we had red maples. And they were still delicious. But maples also have other edible parts. You can eat those little red flowers in the spring. When the leaves are young, I would eat that one, but the young leaves are edible. And the samaras or the helicopters, those little winged seeds, um, you can eat them, especially um, if you, when they're plump, you can peel away those wings and eat the seeds inside. It's a fun trail nibble. And people have eaten the inner bark. Okay, you can make it into bread and make it into flour. And maples are also food for a lot of wildlife. So, terrific tree. A lot of nutrients. And even though it's a natural product, we do want to remember, because I am a nutritionist, remember, we do want to remember that it's very high in sugar. Okay, even though it's a natural source, um, it's natural sugar. So you don't, want to, you don't want to go overboard, you don't want to eat too much. But even if you just eat a tablespoon or two, you're getting a good amount of certain nutrients, especially manganese, which is really important. And it's a super, super rich source of manganese, which is, I won't go into the whole biochemistry of it, but it, um, it's part of what's called superoxide dismutase, which is a, an important antioxidant. Some people consider it the most important antioxidant. So, maple syrup, delicious. Um, well duck cherry, so here's another native tree that I really like. And the cherries on it aren't those luscious ones that you get from the supermarket. They're small, and there's just a little bit of flesh around the pit. But I think when they're really ripe, it's, they're tart and really rich tasting, they're delicious. Um, the native people used to use black cherry for their pumpkin. The pioneers made a nice boozy drink called cherry bounce. And you can identify it, well I won't go, I'm not going into the, all of the identification for every plant because we'd be here all night. But um, the flowers and then the fruits are formed in these racemes. Um, it's the these elongated flower clusters turn into these elongated well, cherry clusters. And the birds love them. And um, they have certain phenols in them that are known to be uh, hypertensive. They're good for you and um, a lot of other nutrients. A good way to identify black cherry or native fruit, Sertina, wild black cherry, even from a distance now, it's like, oh, black cherry, burnt cornflakes. The bark looks like burnt cornflakes. Somebody told me that like decades ago, and I never forgot it, so it really does. Um, so that's our wild black cherry. Um, people are always telling me after, you know, you should have said this. I'm saying it's really um, you want to be careful because um, livestock can get poisoned by eating the twigs and the leaves. Okay, but I'm talking about human nutrition, so I don't know if your dog will get in trouble if he eats it. Or, but um, the berries are really, really nutritious for people. You just don't want to eat any other part. Wild black cherry, they're small. Okay, and here's one that's that's naturalized escaped into the wild that you find sometimes, it's a little bit larger and sweeter, and it's not native, okay? It's bird cherry, you know, Zayman, but it's delicious. Um, you might find that, and it's, they don't come in those elongated clusters, you know, those single cherries. Black walnut. Black walnut's an interesting tree. It's our native walnut that grows wild. The ones we usually buy, like in the supermarket, are English walnuts, and these taste stronger, they taste different. People tend to either like them or not like them. I like them, but they are strong tasting, black walnuts. And they have more protein than English walnuts. They're high in the good fats, the fats that we need more of, those mega threes, and a lot of other nutrients, but they're good for you, black walnuts. A lot of work to get through the 
out of the class. <laughs> yes. Yes, I, I'm hearing people who have experience. Um, the outer green husk, if you get through there, and then the walnut inside. I'm always surprised that squirrels don't get through there. I mean, like, you really have to, like, bang to get them open. And um, they have this loop underneath the husk. If you get it on your hands, your fingers will be, like, stained for two weeks. And I know that from experience. <laughs> so, and then this is the part here underneath the husk that you, you need to bang open. And also, if you're going to plant black walnut, they do um, make up an environment mm -hmm. that a lot of other plants can't tolerate. So a lot of plants won't grow under or near. I think that I've heard like 60 or 80 foot radius sometimes. Your black walnut it, it gives this um, development to the soil with the chemical. Uh, it makes it, makes it toxic for some other plants. I bet somebody can recognize that beautiful, Earth. smooth, yeah, that's our, that's our native peach tree. And because it's so beautiful and smooth, it's the first one to get marked up by graffiti. But our peach tree produces little, little nuts, but they're so tiny and fiddly. It's like I never eat them because it's just so much work and it's like smaller than a sunflower seed and it's too much work. If you ever find ones that have a, a large one that is probably a cultivar or a a European beach. I found some ducks that were like, ooh, okay, I can, you know, I put the time into foraging these, but they're, it was because they weren't the native. But wildlife eat them. Interesting thing, beach in the spring, if you have the branches that are down low enough, you can eat the leaves, and they're mild and tasty. You can eat them, you can make a salad out of them. Um, beach leaves, there's also a bristly husk there. The beach leaves, oh. Eastern white pine, I have some pine here. This is my little show and tell table over here. <laughs> so Eastern white pine, it's native. They went to this part of the world. It's, I always find it interesting, like when some of our things that are native here, like escape into the wild in other parts of the world. And in Central Europe, our Eastern white pine is an invasive species. It's a nuisance. I think that's amazing. I love white pine. Um, it's, the whole plant is full of vitamin C. There's nothing poisonous about a white pine tree. You can identify it because these, these long needles in little bundles, or they call them fascicles of five. So if you want to break some of these off later and take a look, you'll see they're in little bundles of five. And you can take your pine needles and just chop them, <coughs> steep them in boiled water, and make tea. Vitamin C rich tea. And it has more vitamin C, and they've actually done some research on pine. I'm happy about that. And they, they know that the winter needles contain more vitamin C than the spring needles, and lots of other nutrients. That's our native of pine. Stop them, steep them. Okay. American persimmon. I have them over here. They're kind of mushy, so I'm not going to pick it up, but you can see what our native persimmons look like. If you've ever had persimmons from a supermarket, the Asian ones, I now think of them as like mutant persimmons <laughs> because they're so big. Because ours are usually smaller than I got off. But when they're ripe, when native persimmon, any type of persimmon, is really ripe, it's so concentrated and sugary. It's so sweet and delicious. So persimmon. We have them here. Um, at Wildwood, and um, they're really, really good. You just want to make sure that they're right, because if you eat them when they're pretty, like this one here, it'll turn your tongue to leather. They're so astringent. Um, but you want them to be slightly, like really soft, slightly wrinkly, that's one of the best. And identify the bark, characteristic alligator bark there. That's our native persimmon. It's a good one to plant. I would eat all five of them. <laughs> Excellent. And it's like Thanksgiving. Um, you see some flowers, they're still hanging on the tree in December, and they're just perfectly good. Shagbark hickory. The shagbark hickory, this is an interesting one. Excuse me one second. Shagbark hickory has hickory nuts, which are really tasty and really nutritious. And hickories, there are different types of hickories, but some of them, most of them, are bitter, 
Shag bar kickery must or never do. Okay. Um, you can identify shag bar kickery by the shaggy bar. And it's these shaggy plates that come down. Someone once told me it was because Mother Nature made an obstacle course for the squirrels so they couldn't get them. <laughs> okay, no, no, that's true. But um, the shaggy bark that come, and you can find it on the ground, or if you very carefully take a piece of, um, you, can, you can take a piece of pieces off without, um, without damaging the tree. You want to be careful not to damage where it attaches to a tree. But you can take that bark, pieces of the shaggy bark, and what you do is, to make hickory syrup, what you do is you take the bark and you roast it in the oven until your house smells wonderful, about a half hour or so. And then you take that roasted bark and you boil it, boil it in water, just water to cover, and make a strong tea out of it. And then you strain it and you add to that hot tea, you add sugar and boil that down. And it makes, it makes the, I really love it. I think it's the greatest tasting syrup. I should, I'm sorry. That and maple, I love. <laughs> I love maple syrup and I love shag bar kickery. And I remember, actually, Rochelle, I think you said this. Um, and I used to feel the same way, that it's kind of like cheating. It's not really syrup, okay? Because it's not, you're not getting the sap from the tree, whereas you're taking the natural sap from a maple tree and making the syrup out of that. But here, you're kind of making a tea and you're adding sugar to it. So it is kind of like cheating, but I don't have a problem with it anymore because I like it so much. I like the taste of it because it's a very unique taste. And you look at the taste that I've brought some along and you can taste shag bark hickory syrup. Um, it might not be as good as the maple syrup, but it's different, it's just different, it's unique. Um, shag bark hickory syrup. Um, and this is a this is a really underappreciated tree. A lot of people have never heard of this tree when I do foraging tours sometimes. And most of the people have never heard of hackberry. And hackberry is a native tree, and it gets these little fruits. It's actually a seed with a little bit of flesh around it, um, which when it's ripe and dark purple. Uh, it's really sweet flesh. But it's interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, you can take the whole, sometimes people take the whole, I'll show you the, um, when they're right, okay, they're that color there. They take the whole hackberries and you can pound them like with a mortar and pestle and make like a nut milk out of it, like using the flesh and the, and the nut. Um, and native people, a great use of hackberries. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of meadowcock rock shelters. It's a <coughs> huge complex of like rock shelters out. It's southwest of Pittsburgh. And they found like evidence that native people for like 16,000 years were occupying these rock shelters continuously and their biggest food source was hackberries. They found like all of these deposits of hackberry seeds. And, um, I just think it's like really cool. Um, yeah, metaphor of rock shelter. But you can eat those hackberries, they're really nutritious. They have all kinds of goodness in them. And there's another one of those trees where I can identify it from distance because it's that really warty bark. That's what it looks like. Um, and my favorite, this is um, this is one of the reasons why I'm really happy that I moved to Pennsylvania 10 years ago, because I moved here from New Jersey, and New Jersey, it's rare to find brooding pawpaws. I found pawpaw groves, but only one place in New Jersey where you can even find pawpaws here, even at Black Um Pawpaws are the native, largest native fruit in North America. It's like one of, one of those best kept secrets. And they're really delicious. They're like tropical tasting, but they're native to Pennsylvania. They have these um, pretty flowers in the spring. If you get close enough, they have a kind of funky smell. 
because they're, they're, um, they smell like rotten meat because they're pollinated by insects that are attracted to rotten meat. So, um, but they're really pretty little flowers. And then they give rise to these beautiful fruits, pawpaws. They're custardy and delicious. How many people have ever tasted a pawpaw? That's a large number compared to what I usually see. That's great. That's great. I love pawpaws. And um, they're also nutritious. And you can use the pulp like as a substitute, like in a recipe where you use banana, like banana bread, you could always use pulp, pulp, pulp instead. It has its own flavor. It's, um, it's really, really, really delicious. Um, so there's pulp, pulp bread. That's in the next book, too. Um, so some of these trees um, are trees you might have growing on your property already. Some of these trees you might be interested in planting. I have um, two resources that I think are good places to, if you're interested in um, native plants and trees, both of these places have trees. And their websites are good. So you can, um, if you want to buy something or get information on how to, how to plant them, um, they're good. And then if you want more information about foraging and uh, plant identification, there's my website, shameless plug. Um, but I just find it very interesting that um, there's so much out there in nature that we just kind of walk past. Sometimes we walk on it, you know, like Wild Man Steve Brill, if you've ever heard of him, he's always saying, like, you're walking on your salad, you're walking on yourself. <laughs> and there's so much out there that's food for us. And there's so much nutrition out there that we don't even pay attention to. Um, but it's out there. I have, if you want to see the <coughs> of these, these white pine, if you're going to look at the hawthorn, please take my word for it that the thorns on here are really, really sharp. I got a puncture from them once when I was picking hawthorn berries years ago. And um, my finger got infected. They're just really, really sharp. Stack on sumac, the bobs, or the fuzzy berry clusters, wild persimmons. And then we have the shag bark hickory, the bark, and the syrup made from the toasted bark. And I have books if anybody's interested in buying. Um, so thank you very much. I am Karen Truman, and John will be speaking shortly. We're just trying to split up the talk a little bit. Um, like it was mentioned, um, John has been involved in the maple syrup industry. Well, I say industry. It's his family farm. Um, since the early 1990s, um, our, we live, just to clarify, we live in Bucks County, which is outside of Philadelphia, north and west of Philadelphia. Um, the farm that we tap, tap where our 130 acres are is in Tioga County, a little north of Wellsboro. Um, so that's where our farm is, and that's the region facing Pennsylvania that produces most of the maple syrup. Um, and like I said, last year we collected around 25,000 gallons of sap, and that is not misprint, 25,000 gallons of sap, um, which makes around 500 gallons of maple syrup. So it was a really good year. Um, fingers are crossing for this year. We're just getting started. Um, I just married into the family seven years ago and had no idea what I was getting into. Um, <laughs> truthfully, no idea, because he said when we were dating, he's like, oh, do you want to come to the farm and help tap? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, this is no big deal. I didn't know. Um, so yeah, as you can see by the picture up there, that is my tapping outfit. So I have the L.L. Bean coat and I have really good um, thermal underwear and like ski pants and L.L. Bean boots. So you, you got to stick with all the name brands for the winter to be out tapping. The one year we were out tapping, it was minus 15. So a little miserable. Um, I do help with tapping. Um, but I, my specialty is more sales and marketing, so I've been um, doing pretty well with that. Um, and since I've taken over, we our sales have kind of done up a little bit. Let it play up. <laughs> yeah, just leave me alone with my sales, and I'm good. So my background also is that I'm a nurse. So because I'm in the medical field, I had to throw just one equation in because um, I'm kind of a little bit of a science geek. Um, as Diane had said, the maple syrup. This is from the sap of the maple tree. Um, and how it works is the trees store their, the starch in their roots and then it's converted to sugar in the late winter, early spring, which is kind of getting to be almost now, February, March-ish, and it starts moving up the tree. I tell everybody, it's the tree waking up from the winter sleep. Um, the major carbohydrate found in the maple syrup, um, like Debbie had said, is sucralose. 
along with some glucose, fructose, complex carbohydrates, and high molecular weight polysaccharides. So obviously poly meaning a bunch. So there's a bunch of sugars. Um, and as Debbie mentioned, it does have small amounts of the manganese and riboflavin along with zinc and calcium and antioxidants. Um, we have diabetic status, oh, I can't have it. And I say to them, look, obviously, I would not eat, drink, you know, have maple syrup every day, but real maple syrup, as you can tell by our shirts, has very good taste. So you can get away with using less maple syrup on, on your food and get the same taste as you do with the fake stuff. So obviously, you know, you need to be careful. Certainly as a sugar, we would never say it's not, but you know, the real stuff has very good flavor. So a little bit about the history of it. Um, and as of the barging, the, all the credit with maple syrup goes to the Native Americans. Um, they're the ones that started processing maple syrup long before we came over here. Um, from doing research, um, it, the legend goes that a chief of one of the tribes, and we couldn't figure out which tribe it was, I guess got mad at someone and threw his tomahawk in and hit a maple tree. <laughs> The next day, I go, he took his tomahawk out of the tree, and the next day when the, uh, the weather had warmed up, all of a sudden the Indians noticed there was um, sap leaking from the tree, and I guess someone decided to taste it, and they found out that it was sweet. So um, how the Indians would do it is they made um, V-shaped incisions with their, um, see there's some kind of saw or whatever or tomahawks in the tree, and they would um, insert reeds to run into clay um, baskets or the birch bark basket. Um, again, the Indians scavenging everything they could in the forest. Um, they also developed these ritu rituals around syrup making, celebrating the sugar moon, which is the first full moon of spring, which is about the right time for the syrup to run, with the maple dance. Now, I tried to find what the maple dance is, because I think it would be very appropriate if we learned the maple dance, but um, no word. We just heard that it was a celebration for them. Uh, they would have sugar camps near the maple trees, uh, where they prepare for the time the sap would begin to flow. And after I really got into the process, I decided that they did have their sugar cans next to the trees because when the sap is running, you don't sleep. You're constantly collecting sap. So there's been nights that we're running sap over, collecting sap out of our tanks and running it over at one or two in the morning if our, our tanks are really full. So I decided that's why the Indians camp right next to the trees because it was probably just easier for them. Um, the Indians had a really good, you know, the Native Americans were so creative back in their day, and they had a lot of really good ideas. They concentrated the sap by leaving it out in the cold, and the, the water would float to the top and freeze, and then they would remove the water, so then there was less water to boil off when they were boiling their sap. So if you think about it, it's a great idea back then, and they didn't really know what they were doing. They probably did it by accident the first time, but I thought that was an amazing way to save themselves time. You know, just let the water freeze, pull that off, and then you've got less to boil off. Um, so they, you know, they would drag it with their sleds to the fires where they boiled the clay pots. And along the way, I guess they learned it was easier to like boil in one pot and then transfer to another, and others that got more concentrated. Um, so when the colonists showed up, um, the Native Americans showed them how to tap trees too, and of course the colonists had to one up them. Um, prior to the the 1900s. I found it really interesting. The maple sap was actually the primary um, primary source of sugar um, because regular sugar had to come from the West Indies, and being that we're all the way up here on the north, you know, north coast or northeast coast, this was the primary. It, it was it makes sense that this was the primary source of sugar. Um, the colonists decided it was easier to bore holes in the trees, which is I. We, which is, of course, what we do now. And I can see why, because it's just an easier way to direct it. So they inserted wood spouts into the holes and then hung a wood bucket from it um, you know, to collect the sap. Um, and then sometimes they would you know, cut parts of trees and use the trees as containers to haul the sap, um, hollowing out trees. Because again, you know, they, they're all really you know, resourceful and they used what they had. Um, and they were obviously collected as long as the sap remained sweet, which again is the same thing that we do now. And the weather conditions determined, and for us that's still true today, the weather conditions determine how long the sap runs. We have, as man has, no control over how long the sap runs. It runs until Mother Nature's diets are done, and then it stops, and then that's it. And we can't do anything to fix it. We just have to collect as much as we can while it runs. 
Um, and then the course the colonists ha hauled it back to their base camp using horses or oxen. Um, and then they poured it into large vessels. And, and again, same way we're doing now, boiled till it's um, desired, desired consistency. And they either had fire or fires out in the open or they built sugar shacks, which is where our, our, our modern day sugar sh um, shacks came from. And they discovered that the boiling process was very time consuming, which it is. So since 1850, we've made some up major upgrades. Um, the syrup makers started using flat metal pans because the surface area is greater and you can boil a little, it's a little more effective. Um, the first evaporators patented, patented in 1858, um, and this had two pans and a firebox, which decreased boiling time. Around 1900, the sugar makers started bending the bottom of the pan because, again, increasing the surface area because the goal is just to get the syrup hot and get the water off. Um, and then trees started being tapped with metal taps, which drained into metal buckets, and we do have some examples over there. So since then, um, during the 1970s, there was a lot of advances, and we still have some modern day ones that we do too. Um, on our farm, we, we tap, we place around 2,200 taps. Um, so we have, we do, obviously we do not use buckets. Um, any decent sized operation, we have plastic um, tubing systems, which we'll have, we have over there, um, which connect the trees to the lines and the line drainage. We have two drainage tanks for us. Uh, actually, no, we have one drainage tank, one, one drainage tank now. Um, we have main drain lines. A lot of the sugar masters have their drain right into their sugar house. We take our sap to someone else to boil because as you'll hear about the sap boiling process, <clears throat> it's very involved. We have a guy, they have a lot of really expensive machinery. They do a great job. I'm in the medical field. The things you want in the pharmaceutical field, you want reproducible and you want consistent. They do it all, so we just take our stuff to them. Um, we have added a vacuum pump to our system, and the vacuum actually kind of helps suck out some of the sap from the tree, and that doubled our production, um, which was good and bad, but doubled our production. Um, and one of the biggest things that the, the sugar house is using now are reverse osmosis machines. Before they even start boiling the sap, they run it through the reverse osmosis machine, and it removes a lot of the water, kind of like they let when the Indians let the ice freeze and pulled it off. It removes a lot of the water, concentrates it, so then it's actually more energy efficient because when you're boiling the sap, it takes less energy to get the water off because you already have a lot of the water off. And these are some of our pictures. This is a, a tap that goes into a tree and it connects to, this is a drainage line, and all the drainage lines drain into our main lines. And this just happens to be a really pretty picture I took of our, all of our, our, our sugar bushes, our tree area. So that's one of, from one of our, our uh, farce. And then this is um, modern, day. modern day. This is our vacuum system. There's an app for that. So this is our app. We have um, five different sensors, um, and we just kind of label them with where they are so we know if there's an issue, which it is. <clears throat> this was a great day for us because we have green checks. Um, you want the pressure to be green is 20, Around 20 yeah. and above. So this was a good day where everything was working for us. Um, we can sit on our phone and look at and see if like if one of the, like, the apple tree line, if that drops, then we know we have to go over to that forest and walk around and try to find where there's a leak. Um, bears chew on our lines, porcupines chew on our lines, squirrels, trees fall down, ash trees fall down and smash our, our vacuum system, which is what happened over here. There's, uh, well this is us putting it back together, a big tree fell and smashed right down on the system breaking at the end of our season. So we had to spend a couple thousand dollars to replace that because we didn't want to lose it for our season. So this is kind of how it's done in modern times with mm -hmm. a decent sized operation. Now, we're going to get into the specifics of what you guys do. If you guys want to try, you know, harvesting maple syrup in your backyard, it's a lot less involved than this. So The sugar maple has the, the, the highest sugar concentration of the maple. It's up to about 3% of uh, sugar. So basically when you get sap out of the tray, the, the sap comes. It can be up to you know, 97% of its water and 3% sugar. So the whole idea behind that is we want to get try to get all that and we can boil it down and make it. So there's the red maple and the silver maples. Both of them will have a little less concentration of your uh, sugars. Like the silver maple's down to 1%. So you want to try to get uh, 
That's why we're using this. All right, how can we identify, you know, what a sugar maple is? There's a couple characteristics. We can use the leaf. That's the easiest thing. When you have your, your maple trees at your house, look at the leaf. The sugar maple has five very uh, distinct, uh, you know, what a, what what a lobes on them, okay? Center one? Yeah, the center one. Yeah, center one. Okay. Not this one? Wait, can you look at the No, I'm going to go forward. Oh, go on. Okay. So, with the sugar maple, you have it, then it has uh, these big U shaped uh, on the sides of the margins but between the points to help you point it out. So. That's what we're, that's how you, you want to look at the leaves and that, that'll make it the big thing. And, uh, yeah, three to five inches uh, tall. And they have uh, three main veins on them, so that's one of the things you want to look for compared to the other, the other maples. Then it has a, uh, a shaggy bark, like the, like the other ones that, um, it's a nice shag. When they get a little older, the bark starts peeling back off of the tree. It just looks like it's a, it's a nice shaggy bark. That's something you want to identify from it. Okay. They, they look like plate, yeah, for sure. Then the, the younger trees are all, oh, okay, let's go back to this one. The younger trees look smoother, but once they start getting a little more mature, they start looking like that and have that shaggy bark. All right. This is uh, an app we just found, right, for uh, identifying. Take a picture of the, the bark, and it, it will give you, or the leaf, it'll show you, tell you what the tree is in spring that we just happen to stumble across. So, all right. So tapping maple seed trees for in your, at your house. This is what we're, you gotta, you wanna try it out in your backyard, you wanna boil it down. So. Once you find out it's a sugar maple tree, you want to find a sugar maple tree that's at least 10 inches uh, in diameter in order to tap it, and the tree should look healthy. And the more sunshine the tree gets during the day, the better off you are for, um, for um, having sap come out of it. Because we get it down deep in the forest, they don't, they don't produce this, like the, the ones that are sitting there in your front yard. Okay. <clears throat> So how, how do we know when to tap a maple tree? So the season starts anytime now. Like, the, like upstate Pennsylvania, it starts a little uh, later, but around, around this area, it's, it's probably running, the trees are running now. Because you want it to be cold at night, and you want it, um, on this one, yeah. You want it to be cold at night, where, and it, it has to be down freezing, then it wants to go up above 40 degrees, so. And yeah, sap will, uh, wind will affect, you know, the, the tree 100% what you get out of it. You get a south wind, for some reason that sap doesn't flow that day. But if you get northern wind, you get decent uh, flow. So, and. Okay, how much sap do you get out of a tree? So, depends on the tree and how the sun is and all that stuff. But you can get up to two gallons of, two gallons out of a tap per tree per day, if you get lucky. Smaller trees, you get a little less, you get down to anywhere from a quart to a gallon. And some days, Mother Nature just goes crazy on you, and that tree that might only produce two gallons might give you four gallons that day. So we've already had where, next thing you know, you go out there and your tank was this full, go back in about an hour and it's like this it's like where did that all come from you know or you wake up in the middle of the night and your sensor we, because we got sensors there the alarm goes off on the thing there and everything's running and it's just like you don't know what to do so we've had <laughs> some of them days and the days you thought it was going to run nothing came out of the tree so it's just whatever mother nature decides to get you okay how do we tap a tree all right, so the easiest thing, we need some tools for tapping the tree. So, <coughs> over here we got, 
You got your little uh, plastic tap, and we got a little plastic bag, this uh, at home kit. We're doing, and this is a little plastic tap. They come with 516. We bought them, I bought it on Amazon the other day, you know, just for the, so I could bring it and show you guys. Um, so, what we want to do is get a, a battery operated drill, hand bit, whatever. Put a little hole in the tray, go in about uh, two inches. Basically, if it's really big as the bark's thick, you want to be the two inches behind the bark, right? Just drill it in on a slight incline a little, and use the 516 drill bit. If you want to do uh, trees over 18 inches, you can do a couple taps in them. Okay. You want, to, yeah. Once you drill into the tree, you want to make sure you get good tree that you drilled into. You don't want to find out that you drilled into a hollow or whatever, because that won't help you with your sap at all. Uh, and you want to try to drill the hole over like where the main root comes up out of the tree. You'll, get, you'll do better with that. So then once you do that, you tap your little uh, spile which, or tap, you know, into the tree. You just tap it into it. It sort of sets. And you will... Uh, this is that home kit. This goes like this, the tap goes in, this just hangs on it, and just collects your syrup for you, little bag. Okay, and then once the season's all over, once you want to take the, pull the tap out of the tree, so the tree can heal itself for the next year. So if you do it this year, and you want to tap next year, don't use the same hole, move around a little on the tree, one way or the other. So. You can get different holes so you don't want to. All right. All right, collecting of the sap. So I was going to bring sap here today so I could show everybody, tap the tree in my front yard, and Mother Nature has not been nice to me and wouldn't let me bring any sap to you guys. So I was going to bring some sap so I could show you guys what it looks like. Collect the sap every day. I drop. You know, when you're sitting there in these, the, the old buckets or it's coming out of the tap, if it's dropping a second, that's a really nice day for you, right? It tends to flow better in the afternoon when the tree gets really, really warm. So after you collect your sap, you want to dump it through a cheesecloth just to gather any of the, the other things that come into your bucket, you know? You'd be surprised what gets in there. You know, the flies think it's nice to eat and they can't swim, so. <laughs> store sap, and you want to store the sap. You can in the refrigerator or a cool place. If it's snowy outside, just put it on the ground and keep it in something under 38 degrees. Like use a refrigerator. All right, sap's like milk. It will go bad if it's not refrigerated. So you got up to seven days to, that you want to you know use your sap. So you know you want to store it wherever you can. Store it in a glass or plastic containers so you're not getting anything. Sap can freeze, you know, you can freeze the sap until it's ready to boil. Basically, you freeze the sap, like she said, it, some of the water separates off it, throw the water, throw the pieces of ice out, you get better uh, concentration of your sugar and less boiling time. All right, how to boil your sap in your backyard. So, suggestion is, Never do it in the house. That's the first thing. Okay, but some of the stuff we need, you want the outside uh, turkey uh, roaster, you know, where you deep fry your turkey, you put that on there, get a pan, nice roasting pan. Candy thermometer is very, very helpful. You need some butter and vegetable oil as an anti-foaming anti agent and cheesecloth to filter everything. So, in sap, it takes 40 gallons of sap to get one gallon of syrup. So that's a lot of water to boil off. So you're gonna be you're gonna be boiling for a while. One gallon of one gallon of sap is gonna give you three to four ounces of, of syrup. So that's why that's why when you buy real maple syrup, you find out it's expensive because they cut it's a lot of work going in to make boiling that stuff down. All right, so. We're not going to say we know about this, but <laughs> we suggest doing it outside since it creates a lot of steam in your house. And um, my mother will absolutely 
verify that the wallpaper will peel off the kitchen, <laughs> off the wall in the kitchen. Just for so, the sake of your marriage, just yeah. do it outside. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so before you, before you put the sap in the pan, you want to filter everything out. Pour the sap in, into your boiling pan, get the fire as hot as possible, run, run it as hot as possible, and it will take approximately one hour per gallon to evaporate your so if you got 20 gallons of sap out there, figure on 20 hours to boil it down until you get it all, all said and done. Okay, so when you're boiling, there's gonna be some foam will show up on the on top of there. You wanna boil that, you wanna just peel that off, throw it out, you know, it's just put impurities. And then, uh, so we're gonna boil the sap all the way down to there's like about an inch and a half to two inches in the bottom of the pan. The liquid will start turning colors because the sugars are coming out and the, they're darkening up. At this point, take it off there, put it on a controlled fire, like take it into the house, put it on the, the kitchen stove, just for the final stages. And when you, when the syrup inside that, you boil it down to it gets about 216 to 219 degrees, you will have maple syrup, very edible maple syrup, okay? So when you're doing that inside, like uh, we said, it foams up a little. And you don't want to overflow because if you overflow on your stove, it makes a mess. It's a sticky mess, I can guarantee you. So you take a little butter, just put a little butter on something and touch the edge of the pan, takes that foam away. Okay, then after you've done boiling that down, dump it through another set of filters because there's a, uh, you get sugar sand it's called. It's just part of the, the boiling process and they will pull that out and get rid of any of the extra impurities when from the boiling process. All right, syrup must be packed hot, right, at 185 to 190 degrees. If you put it in something like a mason jar and you put the lid on, it'll vacuum seal it then. Once you do that, you can keep it, because uh, there's no, there's no uh, preservatives in maple syrup. So you want to keep it, you know, sealed and covered up. And so put the cap on immediately. You turn it upside down, help seal it. Then after that, you want to store it in a cool, dry place, you know, basement, or you can put it in the refrigerator once you open it. Um, syrup is not not hot packed; can be kept in the refrigerator or freezer. That's where we store most of ours. And base, a lot of it's in the basement. I guarantee it's nice and cool down there. So the season ends. So at the end of your season, how to figure out when your, your season's going. Season, or last into April sometime. Some of the factors, the volume drops you, at the end of the season, tree starts getting buds, the season's over. The sap turns cloudy, so, and smells a little funny. You'll, you'll know exactly when it, that happens. It's not, because the regular sap should be nice and clear, just with a little yellowish in color. And that, the end of season sap is, uh, is not good. All right, right. Okay, everybody wants to know how you get good syrup. I mean, really dark syrup. They have different gradients of syrup. So the dark, robust syrup versus the light syrup. It's all up to mother nature, okay? She decides what you get every year. You can't, you know, you think you're gonna, oh, this is a year, a great year, we're gonna get this, okay? It's just the color and taste and how, what the darkness of it. The darker syrup is stronger and occurs later in the season, but sometimes later in the season you don't get any. Pennsylvania didn't get hardly any dark syrup last year. New York, you know, 20, 20 30 miles north of us was getting dark syrup for, you know, lighter syrup in the early season. You never know. You never know what you get. All right. All right, so back to me. So I, of course, had to throw some fun facts in. <clears throat> so what is fake maple syrup made of? Um, high fructose corn syrup, corn syrup, caramel color, and artificial flavors. That doesn't sound yummy. Go for the real stuff. 80% um, of the world's supply comes from Canada. And just as an FYI, most of our supplies do. So uh, we've learned a lot about the metric system because a lot of the Canada stuff comes with metric measurements. A lot of the, the maple syrup bottles are coming through Canada at some point, so we have like 250 ml and 500 ml bottles. So we, you know, the maple syrup people do know a lot about metrics. 
Um, and I found this interesting. Some of the top maple producers in the U.S., well, Vermont, which is never a shock, 2.55 million gallons of syrup. New York, I was surprised Maine was third. That was a surprise to me. Wisconsin and Michigan are up there too, which I didn't realize. I mean, I knew they did the cheese thing, but I was surprised at the maple syrup. Um, and New Hampshire and then Pennsylvania did 164,000 gallons. Um, maple syrup, it's just, it's for more than just pancakes. I use it in baking. They're flavoring beer with it. You can use it, um, as some of our, there's a bourbon old fashioned that one of our manufacturers sell that does, or a bourbon, bourbon maple, maple syrup that does a good bourbon old fashioned. Salad marinade candy. Um, we sell it to an ice cream company and they actually use it, they make a doggy ice cream and they use the maple syrup to sweeten the doggy ice cream because they told us that the dogs can digest it and it's safe for dogs. Who knew? Um, fun fact for us, we had no idea. Um, so that's uh, about that. Now, thank you for listening to us. We do have a list of resources um, which they're going to hand out. One of the things that we really want to stress, if you really want to learn more about maple syrup, if we've scared you enough now, you don't want to try it, but you want to go learn more about it in person, the Tioga County um, Maple Weekend is a great weekend. It's uh, March 18th and 19th. It's up, um, if you go to the website that is on the resource page or just Google Tioga Maple Weekend, um, there's a whole- Tioga, Potter Tioga Maple, uh... Yes. You'll find it. It didn't yes. take. It was hard to find. Um, it's a great weekend. All the real maple producers. We don't have it. We don't open our farm up because we're just little compared to the scope of things. But there's a whole bunch of maple producers up there. They all have open houses. They all basically try to keep some sap so they're boiling sap that day. Um, there's all kinds of food. Pancakes and pancakes. And pancakes maple milkshakes. Hello. That was I think one of our favorites last yeah. year. Yes. Um, all kinds of amazing foods, and from here, I know it's about two and a half hours, so maybe not, you know, really close, but it's one of those things that the kids are driving me crazy. Go out Friday night, stay Friday night in Wellsboro, so you're up there, so Saturday you can run around and hit a bunch of farms. Um, and this is the time to talk to the people who do it every day, and you can watch all of us up there. You'll see us up there, because we tend to walk around too and see what everybody else is doing. So we all kind of get ideas from each other. But it's a really great time just to see it in action. There's some people that have smaller operations that actually have wood-fired evaporators and they'll be, in, they'll be working that day. Um, the one group that we deal with, Patterson's Maple Syrup, does the boiling of all our syrup. They spend $100,000 on their evaporator, so they're, everything that they do is amazing. And they, they're the biggest maple producer in Pennsylvania, so they have a really great operation. So if you're gonna see one, at least see Patterson's and there's a whole bunch of other ones up there. There's Sunrise Maple Syrup, Sticky Bucket. They're kind of our favorites. Sugar Mama. Sugar Mama, yeah, they have great names too. <laughs> so, I mean. Hamilton's a really big name up there, so. So if you're looking for something to do, it's March. What else is going on in March? Super Bowl will be over. Go, go, you know, spend some time up in the woods to you know, take your family up. And it's a really nice family environment. Everybody's really friendly, more than willing to answer questions. So it's a really great weekend to be up there. So I would highly suggest it. And like I said, the resource list will be available. And posted on your website. Or yeah. So thank you very much. And